Emile Giron's staggering career begins in 1877, when the Swiss man arrives in Athens. The city is undergoing an astonishing revival during this decade. Now that Greece is independent from the Ottoman Empire, wealthy citizens are investing in education and the arts. In the shadow of the Acropolis, a millionaire who is later to achieve great fame has a magnificent villa constructed. Heinrich Schliemann made a fortune trading in golden arms. Now he plans to make a dream from his youth come true by rediscovering Troy and Mycenae, the cities of Homer's heroes. The young Emile Giron hopes to find employment with Schliemann. Schliemann tests his abilities. At least, this is the story that has come down to us. The archaeologist presents Giron with three fragments from a fresco and demands nothing less than a reconstruction of the entire picture. At first, Giron is bewildered, but then Emile produces a sophisticated reconstruction from his own imagination. He draws a charioteer with a spear. Schliemann is delighted. That's what it must have looked like. But then Giron suddenly sketches a temple guard. What's more, this isn't the last draft. He carries on producing various alternatives until the irritated Schliemann finally hires him. After Schliemann's death, Arthur Evans has Giron brought to Crete. Evans has experienced a stroke of good fortune. Not long after starting the excavations, he made some significant finds. Now the fragments need to be reconstructed. Emile Giron can carry on in Knossos in the same way that he worked for Schliemann. His son accompanies him to Crete. The young man is also called Emile. The island is a paradise for archaeologists. Emile Jr. trains his eye on classical structures which have just been excavated and on the expressive faces of the locals. It becomes apparent that young Emile has inherited from his father not only a talent for drawing, but also entrepreneurial skills. And a certain unscrupulous attitude when dealing with the truth, as later critics will claim. Giron is quite prepared to make his employer a hero, if that's what he wants. Emile Jr. draws incessantly, neatly, and with an obsession for detail. Years later, he will take his father's place in the team that is tirelessly excavating Knossos. For four decades, father and son Giron dominate the image of ancient Crete that has become known worldwide and is still popular today, despite its discrepancies. That of a paradise island, in the midst of the wine-dark sea, a fair land and a rich, begirt with water, as the poet Homer proclaimed. The French Archaeological Institute in Athens is a meeting point for artists and scientists. Its director is Alexandre Farnou. Only a few days ago, the archaeologist gained access to the former private archives of the Giron family, so he can provide an expert evaluation. This is the order book of Gilleron Sr. It's the original form of the catalogue used by the Gillerons to offer copies of the archaeological finds. This book contains all the important objects discovered during the excavations, complete with photographs of the restored pieces and explanations. Here, for example, it says, vase from Pylos, documented by the former German archaeologist Müller. Then it states the size of the vase and price. For a long time, archaeologists were only able to provide reasonably accurate depictions of the original archaeological finds with the help of illustrators who sketched them and used watercolors. So Giron Senior is in the right place at the right time. 
and with the right people to develop his talents to the full. He has to capture the shades of color and the intensity precisely at the moment of discovery. The skillful illustrator quickly finds an artistic mode of expression for the style of Bronze Age Crete. At least, the way his boss, Evans, pictures the empire of King Minos. This is a drawing by hand made directly from the original of the fresco, with the outlines of the excavated fragments and the additions that Jules Laurent has suggested in order to recreate the picture. The Minoan tradition of bull leaping involved acrobats racing straight towards the animal and jumping over it. This dangerous practice was part of the religious cult rituals and could end in death. Europe and the USA quickly became gripped by Cretan fever. The newly discovered works of art inspire artists and fashion designers, although others dismiss it all as merely a kind of archaeological fantasy land. The Gillerons produced drawings as if on a conveyor belt, which they then embellished with watercolors. Here's the famous detail from the procession fresco. It was a kind of exercise in graphics, which was then reproduced and sold everywhere in Europe. The lily prints is a revealing example of Giron's working method. Giron simply reinvented the figure. In the case of the Lily Prince fresco, we now know precisely that it has in fact been composed from completely different frescoes. Gilleron did it because that's what Evans wanted in order to illustrate the Minoan Empire. And we experts are still impressed by it, even though the background is much better known today. The archaeologist Nadine Becker is researching the purchase of artifacts by the university during the pre-war period. The Winkelmann Institute is proud of its lavishly made copies from the Giron workshops. They are objects of study for experts and students, all in original sizes, like the throne of King Minos. These exclusive replicas came at a price. Catalogues, purchase orders, and correspondence with the Girons have been preserved to this day in the archives. Original invoices and customs documentation indicate the astonishing sums the Girons demanded, which were paid by the buyers. Using a process which was technically revolutionary at the time, the metal copies were produced by a galvanoplastic method in the Württemberg metalware factory WMF. The Girions sold the exclusive items to their international customers for outrageous prices. But the Girions did not only place replicas on the market. Experts at the renowned museums of Boston and Toronto have also found indications of criminal activities. The museum purchased her in 1931. She's a beautiful piece of work, isn't she? Sir Arthur Evans called her Our Lady of Sports. You know, another interesting thing here is the fact that she's wearing this gold cod piece. Now, that cod piece, in fact, is a penis sheath. Oh, not quite appropriate. Not entirely appropriate. And it's also interesting that the majority of the ivories that turned up you know early in the 20th century AD are female figures and this is because Sir Arthur Evans was very much uh, looking for representations of a prominent female deity his mother goddess and that's probably why he called her our lady of sports because it's a direct reference to the Virgin Mary the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Here too, an ivory figure from the Minoan period was part of the collection, until recently. 
it has now been banished to the archives. Quite a come down for the snake goddess. So what made you suspicious? Especially strange is the damage to her face. The proper left side, you can see, has kind of sheared away, and ivory flakes, this is what ivory does. Mm -hmm. But the features that survive there are centered on what survives. Mm -hmm. But if that damage took place after the carving rather than before the carving, what survives should be asymmetrical or damaged. The scientific analyses are quite interesting, and I was really surprised when they came back. If the statuette is ancient, the ivory should date to about 1450 BC. When the results came back, they were really surprising because they did come back at 1450, but AD, not BC. <laughs> so the ivory that was tested, if not a corrupt sample, is far too recent to be ancient Minoan ivory. So who do you think made her? Well, it would have to be someone who is very familiar with the archaeological material. Mm -hmm. I believe that the father-son team, the GRO, who worked for Evans and had a very profitable business in making replicas, were well positioned to create forgeries like this. Jerome Eisenberg feels this investigation confirms his views. I attended an exhibition of ancient art in Boston and Cambridge and I was shocked at how many pieces, in my opinion, were forgeries. Between 1958 and 1965, I bought some 40,000 pieces, and of, of those, some 22,000 came out of Egypt, and I became rather expert on detecting the forgeries. Our visitors to the museum in Heraklion, admiring a sophisticated forgery, as Jerome Eisenberg claims. However, recent archaeological discoveries could indicate that the disc is genuine. A bronze axe is also kept in Heraklion. On the head of the double axe, there are three lines with overlapping signs engraved upon them. Linguistic experts like Gareth Owens see a parallel here with the stamped symbols on the disc. Gareth Owens and his colleagues have withdrawn to within sight of ancient Phaestus in order to resolve the last mystery of the oldest script in Europe. Now he believes he has finally achieved the breakthrough. He considers that the text on the disc can be deciphered and read. What we have here is definitely a Minoan prayer because we found these words elsewhere on Minoan Crete as well. We have a Minoan prayer for a goddess. My suspicion is that it could be the Minoan Astarte. And Ikwe Kuria, which is the key word on the Festus disc, could well mean pregnant goddess. Ikwe is known from Linear B to be the word for goddess. And Kuria, Kiria, could be the word for pregnant. This wouldn't be surprising when we think that the words on the Festus disc were also found on the top of mountains where Minoan people were making dedications, tamata, to the goddess on the top of the mountains. Another attribute of Astarte, she is the queen of the mountain. Mount Euctus towers over Knossos. The mountain is a magical place. It is said that the father of the gods, Zeus, is buried here. For thousands of years, people have been attracted to the mountain peak, which, from a distance, resembles a sleeping man. Gareth Owens also returns to this place repeatedly. On one side of the mountain, an orthodox chapel with three naves was constructed. Archaeologists then discovered that a sacred edifice with three naves stood on the same site during the Minoan period, almost 4,000 years ago. fascinating to look at the offerings and think that what the Greek Orthodox people are doing today is similar to what the Minoans were doing 36 centuries ago. People don't change. They worry about the same thing. There's continuity. People are worried about their health and they're asking a higher power for help. 
and some of the words that have been found on the Minoan inscription on the same holy mountain, on a very small libation offering that they were doing then, and they were dedicating with parts of the body, but at that time made from clay, not just from silver, have been also been found on the B side of the Festos disc. Not long ago, an apparently insignificant sacrificial bowl was discovered. Linguistic symbols that had not been encountered previously are engraved on it.